Although Jefferson, an old Republican at heart, tried to establish his empire of liberty, the corrupting nature of power ensured the survival of Federalist cronyism. Patrick Newman. Joining me on this episode of Liberty vs. Power is the man himself, Patrick Newman. And uh, we're still going through cronyism, Liberty vs. Power in America, 1607-1849. And we are now going into... Uh, you know, our last episode, we just saw the triumph of the Republicans of Thomas Jefferson, and they now have the uh, the reins of the ship, um, which brings in a, a new cast of characters, some of which we've touched on in the past. Um, but, but I think this is interesting, right? This is a, a peaceful transfer of power uh, from one political party to another. Uh, and really, again, we're seeing a, a, an ideological shift here, a, a, a rejection of the public to the attempt to kind of cultivate old European style governance in the, the new Republic and, and, you know, a, a desire for something fresh. Can you just kind of help set the stage here? Um, you know, with, with what was Jefferson inheriting when he took the office in 1801? Sure. So it's, it's important to <clears throat> understand that Jefferson in, in his, what is Jeff, what Jefferson, the Republican party really was, it, it was sort of this, um, combination of the old anti-federalists who still wanted to participate in the government in in in, in government in government but they didn't know exactly how to do so radical moderates so these are these limited government advocates who ended up supporting the constitution during the ratification debates thomas jefferson is a uh, is a notable example and some disgruntled ex-Federalists led by James Madison who just weren't happy that the Federalists weren't exacting, uh, enacting excuse me, their preferred uh, form of cronyism. So Jefferson is really the, the, uh, the standard bearer of this uh, new party, the Republican Party. It's designed to fight the Federalist cronyism, stop uh, Hamiltonian big government spending, central banking, tariffs, subsidies, uh, the growing militarism, et cetera. And, 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 the, and the Federalist Party, not to, not to cut you off there, but it, it's important also to emphasize the degree to which this entrenched Federalist Party was fighting, kicking, and screaming against this. Now, you, you touch on there's a, 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 a proposed quasi coup during the Adams administration years, right? Like where, where, where Hamilton's trying to conspire to kind of let, uh, to, to use the, 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 the force of the administrative state to override. Uh, a democratic whims. You have attempts to to uh, take over the election system in states that are hostile to the Federalists. Right? I mean, this is a regime that is is trying to do everything they can to to stop this coalition of variety of of, of interests opposing their their claim to power. Right. Right. No. They. Yeah. They, they, this is something I talk about a lot in Chapter Six. Is that. This is one of the reasons I, I, I mentioned, I think, uh, at the beginning when we were doing this, uh, we were starting the, this this podcast, uh, you know, talking about my overall book, is I call it cronyism, and not just crony capitalism, because there is a lot of political cronyism, where politicians are looking to sort of hurt their competitors, uh, people who are also running for elections, et cetera, who could take away votes and reduce power by supporting all sorts of policies, uh, that that are benefiting themselves, and the Federalists were 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 going down fighting. They were not going to just simply, uh, you know, l- let the Republicans run roughshod over them. Uh, nor would they were would, did they really want them to uh, win the election. They were going to take a lot of things that sometimes bordered on illeg- you know, this this blatant illegal nature. Hamilton at one point after the New York elections around this time had swung to the Republicans. So the Republicans would be able to, according to New York law, the state legislatures would be able to choose the electors, basically ensuring that the uh, New York delegation would go for the, uh, the the Republicans. Hamilton wanted John Jay to call a special se- session of of of, um, of of the legislature in order to basically retroactively change the rules, and this is something John Jay he didn't even respond. It was it was too much for him, who was who was pretty much a reactionary, and most people are w- would agree. Even the, even big Hamiltonians would say that was probably not his best moment, so to speak, when he's sort of blatantly engaging in like chicanery, um, you know, to 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 keep the election going for the Federalists. You also have to understand. 1800 and really 1801 when the republics come to power that was the first true 
politi- peaceful transfer of power between political parties. Like in in history, it was really the most you know in, in modern history the 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 uh, the, the, the you know the, the, it was, it was, this is something that had not happened before because what often happened is that when push comes to shove with an election, the existing party in power uh, was just says, "All right, we're just going to stay in power." Like tough, we got the guns. Like there's nothing you can do about it. And this could have been a very bad uh, left turn for the United States, where the Federalists blatantly hold on to power or something. It got very close to that, but they did not. Uh, Jefferson, he, 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 he's, he's elected, uh, the electoral college, um, or, well, uh, he, it was, it was basically Congress at this point. Um, he, he is chosen president and he, he, he ushers in what was seen to be a Jeffersonian revolution. Uh, the, the government is going to go back sort of closer to the articles of confederation. There's going to be this big push towards decentralization. It's just a new time. This is best seen in the fact that this is now, the capital moves from Philadelphia, this hustling, bustling metropolis to this sleepy backwater, the federal city that there's really not much going on there. And at Jefferson's inauguration seems to go pretty well. And well, this is now going to be this time for limited government, et cetera. The anti-federalists who, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the, the former anti-federalists who wanted Jefferson to return to the articles, they were known as the old Republicans. They had high expectations, high hopes for Jefferson. Unfortunately, their hopes uh, became quickly dashed. Well, and, and you highlight kind of Jefferson has this immediate pivot towards moderation. And this becomes very cle- key with uh, uh, several of the appointments he makes at different positions, not only in, within his own cabinet, but in foreign policy positions. I mean, people uh, uh, like uh, you know, families like Livingston and, and Pick, uh, Pickney that benefited from some of these corrupt deals that we mentioned last episode. Um, you know, so he's immediately trying to, to build on this sort of broad coalition, which – you know, with, with a few exceptions, the, the old Republicans kind of get the, the shaft here, though there is one big exception to this, um, which is Albert Gallatin, who we mentioned uh, last episode for being you know, a Pennsylvania leader uh, prior to the, the uprising with the, the Whiskey Rebellion there. But Gallatin, in, in many ways, is not with the, the same sort of, of degree of influence necessarily as a Hamilton, but kind of you know, is, is Hamilton's treasurer. Is, is Hamilton's, uh, or, sorry, is, is Jefferson's uh, uh, treasurer, is, is, is his kind of right-hand man in a lot of the economic issues uh, dealing with, again, a lot of these cronyist policies that he's trying to reverse. Yeah, so <clears throat> what happens is the Republican, so one of the main um, uh, p- p- parts of my book, that this liberty versus power uh, theory, which, you know, this is that cronyism is explained by the the battle between the forces of liberty and power. So According to theory, that when power is in control of the government, such as Hamilton and the Federalists, et cetera, cronyism goes up. <clears throat> and we see this very clearly in the 1790s. Uh, they're able to pass, Federalists are able to pass various crony policies related to finances, related to military, et cetera. And then uh, the forces of liberty win in the Revolution of 1800, Jefferson and the Republican Party. They take control. And so you would expect cronyism to decline now that you have uh, people who are supportive of big government. They are against cronies to be in control of the government. Unfortunately, as the liberty versus power theory teaches us, that this is only partially true, especially really just initially, and this is because power corrupts. So when you're in control of the government, you now have uh, power right in the government, and so that power, the ability to pass government intervention, uh, corrupts or increases the tendency of the libertarian politicians to pursue their own forms of cronyism. Right. And so they start to moderate. They say, well, what we said in the campaign was we wanted to totally get rid of the Bank of the United States. Well, we don't actually mean that. We just want to maybe downsize our involvement in a little bit or just put put the right people in charge. Oh, when we said we were going to get rid of the Judiciary Act of 1801. Well, we didn't really mean that. Maybe we just wanted to ensure some good Republican judges are in there, so on and so forth, right? And this is because the forces of liberty, they got to look ahead to the next election. They want to expand their coalition, et cetera. Jefferson was particularly susceptible to the last issue. Jefferson was you know, sort of the quintessential moderate. 
he was great in rhetoric and great in ideology. You got him to write something, and he wrote plenty of hardcore documents in the 1780s and the 1790s. Right. And of course, the Declaration of Independence. Um, I mean, he, he, he was fantastic when he was in charge of governing things. He did not always follow through. And so Jefferson, he wanted to bring Federalists into the party. He just wanted to have one party, keep everyone happy, this big Republican party, it would be great. And so he wanted to bring Federalists into the fold. He wanted everyone to shake, you know, shake hands and, and, and hug and et cetera. And then, well, just with the right people in charge, the Constitution and uh, Congress and the presidency, et cetera, it could have a relatively um, uh, you know, limited government uh, perspective. But Jefferson, he, he does moderate early on. He doesn't really appoint many old Republicans to relevant positions. Uh, the only one is Albert Gallatin, who in many ways was a moderate in other uh, in other areas. And instead, he goes with the, the ex-Federalists. And this is best seen in the fact that his Secretary of State is the uh, most notorious ex-Federalist. And uh, that's James Madison. And, and I think it's interesting because you know, in contrast, however, you know, as Hamilton, as, as Jefferson is not necessarily doing sort of like the full drain the swamp. Right. You know, he only removes, I think, you know, I think a fourth of a lot of the, the Federalist appointees and things like that. Um, you know, one of the first big battles is over the Federalists refusing to leave. Right. It's, it's over the judiciary. It's over last second midnight appointments and things like that. And, and, and you mentioned this is you know, uh, uh, the, the degree to which the Federalists cling to power almost, is, it even insults Jefferson. Like it's almost a, a, a counterproductive measure there, just how over the top they try to do to, to maintain their power. Uh, but one of the early uh, problems, though, and again, I, I think this this is just something that hits you know, throughout your, your, your chapters here on, on, the, on Jefferson, is that it, again, not going far enough. Um, the Republicans are able to repeal the Judiciary Act of 1801, which is kind of a, a saving grace. You know, gets rid of some of the, the most vulgar judicial appointments, but they do not get rid of the 1789 Judicial Act. And so, again, what you have effectively created is that while Hamiltonians have been removed from office uh, in the legislature and in the White House, we now have the third reign of government, uh, which is the judicial system that is flexing its muscles it is imposing itself on this new old republican ish regime and here you have the federalist power maintaining to have relevancy uh, through uh, the the supreme court of john marshall uh, who who yes has, has the famous quote that uh, compared to hamilton he is a mere a candle beside the sun at noonday he is very much uh, driven by restoring this sort of Hamiltonian view of government. And here you have a, a Jeffersonian administration uh, that seems for almost the get go on top of their own direct appointees in the administration itself um, is, is weak to start off with. Uh, it, it does not make the necessary victories needed on the judicial front uh, that it, that you know, ends up playing a, a major role in not only you know, issues for, for Jefferson down the road, but really kind of cements uh, a, a, a political system that we're still dealing with the ramifications now with the degree to which the courts have so much more power uh, than you know, any other office out there in, in many, many yeah, ways. Yeah, absolutely. You, you made fantastic points. And this is something that really goes, um, I don't think it's it's a properly appreciated, but the a lot of cronyism in United States history it was basically protected or even caused by the judiciary. The judiciary is not a minor partner in cronyism, right? It, it, it in many ways uh, reinforces, it strengthens cronyism of various laws. <clears throat> it empowers uh, the executive and Congress to do certain things, et cetera. And this is why so many anti-federalists, uh, both when the act was passed and even subsequently, they were against the Judiciary Act of 1789, which really created the Supreme Court and the system of um, inferior courts. A lot of people might not necessarily know this, but there's nothing in the Constitution that says, you know, that, that describes the Supreme Court really in any sort of detail per se. It just says Congress has the ability to create a court, much like there's nothing in the Constitution that says 
uh, the uh, president, you know, the, the, the president has um, can have these executive cabinets of X, Y and Z. It just says the, the president has the power to appoint the heads of executive cabinets that Congress creates. It's sort of vague and it's wrapped up. You know, it's, it's, it's wrapped up in, in, in there. It's, it takes time to unwind, sort of like, I guess, an accordion might be a good a good way of describing this. So the Federalists, after the election of 1800, they lose the executive, they lose the legislature, but they still have the judiciary. Adams had appointed um, uh, John Marshall to be chief justice. Who is John Marshall? A lot of people don't really know this, but this is one of these interesting facts that I think is extremely important is that John Marshall's younger brother, James Marshall had married the daughter of Robert Morris, one of the wealthiest men at the time, (laughs) huge land speculator. John Marshall had worked with Robert Morris on various land deals, so on and so forth. And like a lot of biographies, they just sort of like casually mention this as if, as if it's not important. And when I read this, I'm like, wait a second, that's, this is huge. This is like spent a lot more time talking about this and less about, you know, other sorts of early, you know, you know, random facts from his early life, et cetera. And so John Marshall starts to engage in what's known as judicial review, which is that the Supreme Court will start to review um, the constitutionality or the uncut constitutionality of various uh, legislation. And he's doing this to basically protect prior Federalist cronyism. A lot of Federalists were afraid that now that the Republicans in control, they were going to repeal the Bank of the United States. They were going to maybe default or even repudiate part of the national debt, uh, you know, downsize the military, uh, repeal various laws like the Judiciary Act of 1801, so on and so forth, and that John Marshall now wants to use the Supreme Court as kind of like a sniping tower um, so it could strike down, could stop all of these uh, reform movements dead in its track by basically saying, oh, you can't do that. That's unconstitutional. And it's really, a, you, you, you mentioned this, and I think it's important. It's a great way, it's a great example of how the swamp, so to speak, kind of like defends. It's sort of like a turtle. You know, the turtle goes in the shell and it's like this rock, you know, it's this impenetrable edifice, right? Because then the, the judiciary, they sort of act and, 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 and they, they, they try to prevent the Republicans from, from weakening the government. But uh, they 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 extended their 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 reach too much, and they were the Republicans were able to repeal the Judiciary Act of 1801. Unfortunately, they didn't go farther, as you mentioned, by repealing the Judiciary Act of 1789, or really Jefferson even really appointing hardcore strict constructionists to the Supreme Court. And that really just kind of sets the stage for later examples of moderation and failure. Because you're you're only getting rid of some of the government, so then the next time the government's going to increase further, and cronyism will follow through, and and then you know you're now you're you're five steps back as opposed to two steps back. So the judiciary not taking the judiciary head on, and this is something that uh, happened during Jefferson's years as well as later years. This is a really big problem that impacted the future of special interest legislation in the United States. And and with with one uh, defense of, of Jefferson on this point, he, they, there there is some attempt to do to do some of this. Um, there's an impeachment trial over Samuel Chase, who was a Supreme Court justice. Um, I know some divisions there between Jefferson and Burr end up uh, uh, causing some schisms there. That ends up leading to Burr leaving the uh, uh, administration in the second term. Um, but there is an attempt to at least try to impeach some justices. It just that that measure fails. And then Jefferson kind of responds to it by just continuing to pivot in the middle. Oh, absolutely. And this is uh, the the impeachment is it's sort of an ingenious way of dealing with the problem uh, where basically, well, we can't get rid of we we can't just get rid of these position, you know, the, the, the these judges. Uh, so we're going to indirectly try and do so by by impeaching them, at least trying to exercise the rotation in office through this way because they're choosing not to do it through more direct ways. But it it it, it, it there, there's resistance to this. It it only uh, goes so far, and then so the whole thing just kind of dies in its tracks. And that John Marshall is is sort of uh, ensconced. He's protected in the Supreme Court. And this is a this is a big issue. Rothbard had mentioned this, that a big problem with the Supreme Court is it's an elite group of people who have lifetime tenure and they're very insulated uh, from political control. So they're insulated from rotation. 
And this is just, um, it, it, it really does affect the, 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 the future of the Supreme Court because the Supreme Court early on during the years of John Marshall, it wasn't really used so much in the 1790s. This is because Hamilton was always there to provide some sort of constitutional guidance and cases had to be actually heard in the, the system of lower courts before the Supreme Court could, could hear them, et cetera. Um, but the Supreme Court under the Marshall era uh, took basically a very big government uh, pro-cronyism stance. And this this uh, was really cataclysmic for the, the, the future of reform. Okay. Right, so moving away from the, the weaknesses and some of the appointees and the Supreme Court measurements, um, let, let's go to where this kind of, kind of the good stuff here. And, and that is, you know, even though not necessarily a uh, strongest top to bottom, um, Albert Gallatin as Treasury Secretary, he has assisted with other old Republicans such as John Randolph and uh, Nathaniel uh, Macon, who I, I believe Jefferson called uh, the last of the Romans, kind of just referring to this very you know, true Republican virtue aspect of, of public service. Um, Gallatin is... Again, the the Republican sort of of, of you know opposition uh, the Hamiltonian uh, uh, framework. He has his own. He writes a sketch of the finances of the United States, which is kind of a very uh, a, a, you know, in depth dive into public you know public economy from an old Republican standpoint. The the focus on repealing internal taxes, on cutting spending, uh, on you know, not necessarily the outright abolition of the Bank of the United States, but changes here. Uh, uh, there are some very significant policy gains made from uh, uh, this perspective influenced by Adam Smith uh, it, within the mold of again, Secretary Albert Gallup. Yeah, absolutely. And so uh, this, however much I criticize the Jefferson administration, I call it failed. A lot of that criticism is especially, especially relates to the the second administration, the first administration, there were some crucial moderations. The, Liber the Louisiana Purchase had a lot of problems. Um, overall, though, I mean, he was fairly successful. You know, libertarians, you know, beggars can't be choosers, so to speak. So, you know, when there are being steps used to reduce the size of the government, to cut down taxes, to cut military spending, et cetera, I mean, that that's very good. So the, the first administration overall in my book, you know, get, gets, gets about an A. Gallatin was the one uh, bright spot, uh, you know, in, in, in Jefferson's uh, cabinet, right? He was the secretary of the treasury. I don't agree with everything he did. He was pro Bank of the United States, uh, which led to some issues, but he was very frugal. He was very influenced by Adam Smith. So he, he, he was appreciative of free markets. He was against sort of Hamiltonian mercantilism, et cetera. And through uh, through the individuals you've mentioned, guys like John Randolph and uh, Nathaniel Macon in Congress, they, they were able to uh, reform the government in certain respects, get rid of the, the whiskey tax, right, which led to a huge decline in the number of treasury officials in the government. So it was sort of a quasi-permanent reform. They were able to downsize uh, parts of the military. Okay. There were some issues with the Navy and that had to deal with the Barbary pirates, but Gallatin wasn't behind that. That was Jefferson's fault. They did continue to sell off stock in the, uh, the government's ownership of the bank of the United States, which sort of privatized the institution a little bit. Uh, these are all important reforms. They deserve to be mentioned and really the main credit for them should go to Albert Gallatin as, as, as you, uh, discussed. Yeah, just some figures here um, that, that you mentioned. You know, it, it, when they take over in 1800, internal taxes make up about 7% of, of government revenue. By the time that we're, we're looking at that second administration in 1804, they make up less than one. Um, the bureaucracy in 1801 is larger than it is in 1826 um, by several hundred staffers. So again, there really is this significant yeah, you know, there is there is you know, the swamp is drained to a certain extent, and I, I think this is interesting. Is all, you know within some of the in intellectual conversations, particularly on the right right now, there is a, a holding up and champion of, of Hamilton as sort of the embodiment of like early American greatness. Uh, but but yet, if if you recognize just how kind of how you know 
it, it went on too long, right, from our perspective, right? But, you know, it, it was three administrations in Hamilton, or three, three terms, and the Hamilton policies were so unpopular, so destabilizing that we had this people's revolution in 1800. It really is, if you're looking for a common good political economy, right, it, 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 the, the focus on reducing public corruption and the impact that these these state privileges have not simply on sort of you know a, a, a spreadsheet sort of number you know not just some of the, like the cost of of corruption here and there but genuinely the the, the impact of this you know of, of of a small government economic system on the virtue of their society i think is something where again like the the, the, the gallatin system the impact here, that the successes of this first Jefferson administration, if we are looking at, you know, what is the core of economic uh, American exceptionalism from a, a political economic lens? I think these are the years that we should be looking upon. Again, you're touching on you know, some of these accomplishments that we very we did see play out. Yeah, absolutely, and the, 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 those are all very important issues. I think they are related to. When I uh, mentioned Jefferson, it's it's it, I'd be remiss to to, to, to neglect his. Empire of Liberty concept. This is something I refer to in my own. I refer, I refer to in cronyism, and it's very important because what Jefferson wanted, sort of his ideal society, is that well, the you, the the land mass of North America would be governed by these the system of sort of these decentralized confederacies. Uh, he thought the Pacific Coast would be a totally separate government. Uh, he wasn't really concerned if there was one government, you know, or, or just multiple confederacies and they'd be linked sort of by common cultural norms and language, et cetera. So you would have sort of this system of limited government, um, English, uh, societies that were insulated from all the problems of the old, uh, order in Europe be it from the Atlantic ocean. And of course that's not like an anarcho capitalist society, but, uh, you know, I'd like to live in that. That'd be pretty cool. I I'll take that any day of the week. And, uh, you know, he, he wasn't able to get there, but this is something that really animated a lot of Republicans at this time was that says, Hey, um, it, 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 we, you know, let's create the, you know, we want to return to this system of limited government. We don't want this massive empire. That's going to lead to a lot of problems. And I think it's a very important remark. It's entirely justified because a lot of times, especially uh, when we're looking back at American history, we sort of think that it's preordained that the United States had to become the size that it was supposed to be, that we just have in our mind, all right, we've got the continental United States from the Atlantic to the Pacific, and then there's this weird ice box known as Alaska, and there's a little island in Hawaii. It's like any sort of deviation from that would be like this terrible calamity that, uh, you know, must be stopped at, you know, at all costs. In reality, the modern United States only came about through a series of very unique uh, circumstances, a lot of it related to cronyism and conquest in that the modern United States turned into the empire of power, not the empire of liberty Jefferson had longed for uh, before he became president. Well, and this guy kind of, I think we're going to touch on with our next episode on sort of the, uh, the, the, the fall of the Jeffersonian revolution, but it, it is interesting. I mean, one of the attempts made to create a, 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 a parallel republic, uh, what was from uh, Aaron Burr, uh, Jefferson's first vice presidential, uh, vice president who, uh, who tries to uh, uh, motivate American troops uh, and, and military members, including Andrew Jackson, and a few others to, uh, to move against Spanish controlled New Orleans uh, and, and take over uh, prior to the Louisiana, around the same time of the Louisiana Purchase. So it is interesting Jefferson in theory versus Jefferson practice, not always on the same page, uh, unfortunately, and again, particularly in ways that we're going to dive into further on the next episode. Um, but but since we're this, this all kind of has a little bit of a, a defense aspect in it as well, just one other point about Gallatin that you you highlight that I think is really interesting is the degree to which he, he also had a, a, an understanding of the military industrial complex you know, in, in, a, in an early sense. Um, where he, he he warns about the, the the way which defense spending creates a vested interest group, uh, and and obviously when we're seeing a rise, you know you, we have uh, not only at the end of the Adams administration do we have the tensions between France and England, 
Um, but as you uh, men mentioned briefly earlier, um, you know, the Barbary pi uh, pirates uh, uh, hassling American ships, uh, f fueling a military response, which you highlight uh, Navy Secretary Robert Smith, who had a background in the shipping industry in particular, may have had a role in, in really uh, a fattening uh, the, the physical response uh, to uh, uh, the, the, the Tripoli War and perhaps uh, a, an example right there in practice of Gallatin's concerns about vested interest groups and foreign policy. Yeah, absolutely. So th there was this issue with the, the Barbary pirates, and this is a lot of mainstream historians. They say, well, this is our, the United States had to show with its, its supremacy on the, on, 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 on the world stage. You had these clear, what might be considered terrorists nowadays, um, or at least of like 10 years ago, they were uh, kidnapping American pirate, American uh, sailors, et cetera. This is in North Africa. This had to be stopped. So, you know, we had to send, uh, you know, the, the Navy. And in doing so, this is our first war. We showed that we were a government to be respected with. And, you know, yeah, you, you got to do all that stuff. And, well, a lot of people, they forget that they don't talk about that, how people like John Adams uh, mentioned that actually they were looking for tribute. In that, while this tribute may or may not have been just, uh, I mean, it was it was unjust. They were basically looking for taxes. Um, the, the Barbary pirates is that it was going to cost less to pay them than to go fight them, right? So from the phys from the fiscal side, it's just well, let's just let's just pay them off, basically. In that, yeah, you know, instead of fighting them, uh, you know that 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 was probably the the the, the proper response to 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 do you know to do. But Jefferson didn't want to do that. He wanted he was he was against the Barbary pirates from the 1780s. An additional thing, and this is something I talk about in my book, is that he wanted to bring disgruntled Federalists into the Republican Party. And what better way of doing that than pleasing uh, the various naval interests, who at the time were basically located in New England and in shipping centers like Baltimore, and they were overwhelmingly Federalist. And you look at Jefferson's various appointments related to the the Chipotle War, et cetera. And this is, uh, yeah, it, it, it's a clear instance of this and in that he's supporting this law. I mean, he's supporting this war partially as a way of pleasing the Federalists. And of course, when you look at America's wars, as I do throughout this book, and as well as many other scholars have done, there's a lot of cronyism that goes into wars, that goes into the financing of the wars, that goes into who is going to be the contractors for said war, so on and so forth, and that this is clear, and that there were various vested naval mercantile interests that were benefiting from this. This is uh, Al Albert Gallatin was against it. John Randolph was against it. Both of them were against the war. Unfortunately, they couldn't persuade Jefferson uh, to back off of sort of uh, his bellicose demands. Another area where, again, if we're looking at, uh, again, battles against cronyism, um, while, again, we mentioned earlier that Gallatin has a bit of a soft spot for uh, the Bank of the United States. Can you touch on a little bit about his specific defenses? Because, you know, there, there was a sort of a narrative out there that, if, if, if I understand correctly, the Bank of the United States sort of played a role in checking excess a uh, uh, paper currency coming out of state chartered banks, right? And so there was sort of a, a argument um, that a, a Bank of the United States was was genuinely necessary for helping preserve sound money rather than inflationist policies. Uh, uh, can you touch on that defense before we get into some of the, the interesting political backgrounds? There's a lot of fun stuff that's here in the, the, the partisanship of the financial sector. Uh, Gallatin's own sort of arguments in favor of a, a federal bank. Yeah. So the uh, Gallatin basically, um, although he was an old Republican, he was not as uh, anti central banking as uh, other old Republicans, such as uh, John Taylor, et cetera. And that John, uh, he, he was, he was, he says he's a Swiss at heart. So he's got a, he's got definitely got a little bit of a soft spot for exactly, exactly for banking. He, he's, he's not, he's not, uh, he's, he's not, he's not full American, I guess. You know, he, he's got, he's got the elements of, of, of Europe in him. And, and so he's got the banking that the Swiss, uh, the, 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 the Swiss bank um, genes are in him is that Gallatin basically argued that, well, uh, and this is this is kind of an issue where Chorda goes a little bit of the flip-flopping because previously Gallatin had criticized the Bank of the United States lending practices. 
he, now he argued that, well, the bank is actually useful because it can make loans to Congress when it was in trouble. And the bank's branches uh, allowed the government to easily transfer money across the country and, and, and so on. And, and that th it was it was basically that, well, in the right hands, the central bank could be used. The Bank of the United States could be used for the benefit of Jefferson and the Republican Party. And so Jefferson basically sided with the, the, the this argument. Right. He said that, OK, it would this is this is this is OK. We'll keep the bank. And this is a real shock for a lot of Jeffersonians, such as John Randolph and John Taylor, because Jefferson's uh, one of his favorite um, things to do was to criticize the bank in the 1790s. So this is uh, admittedly a, uh, a stain on Gallatin's uh, great record uh, that he 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 thought the Bank of the United States could be very useful to the government, um, this, you know, transferring money and making loans to it. And that this by by not getting rid of the bank, what Jefferson basically did is he said the bank was constitutional. Okay, and then that weakened um, the, the 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 various roadblocks to expansions of government power. So not getting rid of the bank during Jefferson's um, uh, presidency uh, was a big issue. Okay, and it had uh, long uh, standing ramifications. But he he does still kind of have this, you know. Uh, he uses the words, I think, that it, he talks about uh, weakening the, a powerful enemy, which sounds very Jacksonian in, in kind of a later later date, um, kind of a view of the bank itself. But, you know, while they, they do not abolish the bank, they, they do do some important things from a, a kind of a reform sort of standpoint. Um, as you mentioned earlier, they sold all, this, all the federal stock in the bank. Um, but just by reducing the government debt, it made the bank holdings go down. Uh, but but the, the Republicans really embraced chartering other banks as a way of creating greater competition to the bank of the United States. And, and it kind of creates a, a that sort of mechanism as some sort of check on some of the privileges here. Yeah, that, it, it, that's a, those are those are great points. And in, in, uh, the 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 Republicans, they weren't great, you know, on on, you know, going the full hardcore uh, aspect on on banking or how maybe as modern Austrians we, we would like this. Part of the reason, as I talk about, is because Adam Smith and many other proponents, uh, really Adam Smith, who was very influential, uh, otherwise had a pretty free mark, other you know, benefit, free market influence on American politicians. A weak spot was monetary uh, was was monetary theory and policy with Adam Smith. Even the most hardcore Smithians, uh, free market Smithians, will admit this. Hamilton was able to use it to his advantage during the bank debates, and. Um, the Jeffersons are Jeffersonians are kind of left a little flat footed. They know how to criticize monetary cronyism, don't necessarily know what to replace it with. Something that they do end up replacing it with is that, at least on the state level, they engage in what's really a, a, de, a de facto deregulation by just saying, all right, we're not going to get rid of the chartering system. We're just going to issue a lot more charters, right? Which is that if you're if you're making doctor's licenses easier to get, then you're really just deregulating the system. Of course, it's not perfect. You still have the licensing system for doctors, but if it becomes a lot easier for doctors to get it, or at least easier for certain people to get it, then it's a uh, deregulation. Unfortunately, there are issues with this because the power to charter is still in control of the state legislature, so you can play favorites. So in my book, I go through all of these these examples in various states on how. Uh, you know the, the the Republicans, they would they 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 would talk the talk, but they wouldn't always walk the walk. They did, you know, issue more charters, et cetera, but they played favorites because they moderated. They realized that if they get bank bankers in the financial groups supportive of banking on their side, then they are going to vote for them in elections. Okay, which is again desire to expand your electoral base. It's a corrupting problem, and and so on. So this is uh, the 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 bank deregulation that goes on the state level is a fascinating um, side story of the the struggle between liberty and power and the the cronyism that results from it. Yeah, I think it's interesting the way that you highlight some of these explicit, explicitly partisan aspects of this financial system. I mean, you you can. I think it's interesting with some of the parallels out there right now on sort of the degree to which uh, uh, you know, the need to create sort of parallel institutions, right? The, the fears of 
you know, say people on the right having the banking system use them by progressive woke capital or whatever. I mean, that that really was sort of the the setting here. Um, you know, you, you had Aaron Burr's bank in, in New York City going up against Hamilton's bank and you know, the, the attempts of using the legislature to, to help benefit one at the expense of others. Uh, you know, it, similar things playing out with, you know, explicitly Republican banks in Pennsylvania going against explicitly Federalist banks in Pennsylvania. I mean, you really do see the degree to which uh, uh, a partisanship is completely dividing these institutions. And, and I think it's also important because it's the same sort of thing that's happening you know, w- within the press, right? You have, you have newspapers. In fact, uh, uh, something I, I meant to mention earlier is that one of those other signs of, uh, of, of moderation from Jefferson was simply the decision to go with a, a more moderate Republican newspaper as sort of the, the newspaper of choice over the most radical you know, again, when we're talking about these partisan party systems here in, you know, the 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 you know, 18th century, the 19th century, these really are parallel tracks rather than sort of this, you know, uh, a, a politics as sort of theater. Uh, uh, you know, we're, we're in the 20th century. Everything, you know, there's, there's, the, the two parties they disagree in public, but there's a lot of of agreement behind the scenes. Here, there really was divides and, and separation uh, depending upon you know where your political loyalty was. yeah that's a, that's it's a great point it's a fantastic um illustration of the differences between politics back in the day and politics now where politics it was fiercely competitive in a sense that you took sides you you just really tried to bring out the faithful in elections and whichever side brought out more of its faithful won the election in that one way you would communicate to the faithful was through these newspapers. And as a side note, I I love newspapers. If you actually look at old newspapers in the 1800s, they always had a section, it's huge paper, you know, uh, pages. And they always had a section that would take up one page. And it was was sort of collections of all sorts of other little uh, one or two sentence lines from other like-minded newspapers. So it was like a collection of tweets you, were, you could scroll and you would see it's like a lot of newspapers. They would just collect various information from other newspapers, et cetera. And so I just always found that as like, oh, well, it was like the it was like the, the, the Twitter of back in the day. You know, you'd be updating these, um, you know, once once a day and so on. But, yeah, having Jefferson, he, he chose to um, he chose. I think it was the National Intelligence or was his preferred newspaper as opposed to the Aurora. And this 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 was upsetting. Uh, uh, the national intelligencer basically became, uh, as time went on, it became sort of the, the spokesman for cronyism in the swamp. It would basically uh, support uh, Congress's various special interest legislation in the newspaper saying, oh, this is going to benefit the public. This is a this is a good thing, et cetera. And in return, Congress would grant it uh, the it, w- it would give it various lucrative contracts for printing documents. So the actual publishing house of the newspaper. Uh, this happened at the state level as well as the federal level. This is a really clear example of alliance of throne and altar, right? And this is like media is uh, corrupt now. And it was <laughs> it was corrupt back then where they would support these policies. And in return, uh, the Congress would give them these printing contracts that, you know, court, uh, so they, they would literally be like, you get a 40% rate of return, you know, these extremely lucrative printing contracts that you're like, oh, well, of course you're going to go for the bait. And yeah, that, 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 that was, that was an issue. Um, but you know, the, 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 the Jefferson, the, Je- the Jeffersonian, um, era is, is really, it's, it's just a great example of a, of a missed opportunity. Some notable advances were made by Gallatin, uh, et cetera. But during these early years, it was, it was really moderation. Um, it was, but there was a, still a downward uh, trend uh, in cronyism, it was more instead of being a total hack and slash, it was really just kind of a slow whittling away. But unfortunately, uh, matters sort of took a turn for the worse, really beginning with the Louisiana Purchase, which is a whole story into itself. Yes, and we will be getting on the the Louisiana Purchase and the corruptions of land uh, from the Jeffersonian administration with the next episode. Um, but what, what, one little, uh, last little anecdote on the banking issue that I just enjoy because Henry Clay is not one of my favorite American figures, particularly as a Jacksonian. Um, but I, I love that here, here we had Henry Clay, uh, fighting for, uh, a rechartering state banks against the bank of the United States because he is personally invested, 
uh, in uh, banks in Kentucky and Maryland. And, and even, even though he was otherwise, you know, very Hamiltonian, a lot of his other economic viewpoints here, we, we had some skin in the game for, for some uh, higher uh, stock payments. Uh, his investments in, in, in you know, smaller state banks uh, trumped his interest in the Bank of the United States, um, which eventually does kind of uh, term out uh, uh, later on when uh, uh, George Clinton, who's the vice president at that time, rules against it. Um, but it's, again, Clay trying to, to get every l- little last dime he can. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's that's one thing that was always true about him. And and uh, yeah, a lot. Some state banks were against the Bank of the United States, not because they were against central banking per se, but just because they wanted those state banks wanted the uh, Bank of the United States monopoly on federal deposits. They basically wanted more of that cronyism to themselves, because if the federal government is storing money at these banks, these banks have a lot more money they can use to make loans, so on and so forth. So it's just a great profit exa- profit um, opportunity. So Henry Clay, uh, early on in his career, he took an anti Bank of the United States stance. I won't necessarily say central banking, but of course, later on, um, he becomes a, a, an enthusiastic supporter of the second bank of the United States. So Henry Clay, he's also not one of my favorite politicians either. And so that kind of leaves us here, you know, at, we kind of, we, we skipped a little bit ahead on, on kind of just resolving the bank topic, but we are going to get into, uh, the second term of the Jefferson administration, uh, to, to lean heavily from a, a quote of yours. The Republicans had laissez faire in their grasp. The empire of liberty was on their horizon. Unfortunately, matters quickly change in 1803. Um, I, 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 can, I, I think this stuff is just so fascinating because you know so much of this stuff continues to ring true, regardless of whether it is the political successes of, uh, yeah, even to a certain extent, the, I, I think some of the, the failings of Jefferson were, were true with some of the Bourbon Democrats after the Civil War. And them trying to reclaim, uh, build up the Democratic Party then, um, true with the old right, true with some of the, the conservative movement victories in the 1980s, um, and, and some of Rothbard's critiques on, on you know why the right continued to fail throughout the 20th century. It, it is the, the, the inability to fully appreciate the need to purge the ranks of you know the cronious aspects of the past and to fill these positions with your own people. Again, it's just so fascinating to see how much true it was during the Jeffersonian days. Um, it's going to be interesting to, to contrast that with some of the Jacksonian stuff, which kind of is kind of yeah, going to sell itself as, you know, it, it's in its own right, a, a resurrection of the spirit of 1800. Again, just the parallels from there that we can still learn from today in this sort of stuff, I find fascinating. Um, Patrick, before we go, is there any last sort of pivots here on, again, when we're talking about the good stuff of the Jeffersonian era, any any last little tidbits that you think listeners should know? Um, <laughs> no, I, I think really we kind of covered the basics. I think the Jeffersonians, really, I think just you should know that we'll talk more about this later on in the podcast uh, series, just more about the old Republicans, about men such as John Taylor and, and, uh, and John Randolph and how they were really sort of hardcore libertarians, they were anti-state, they were small government, et cetera, and that they really did try to make an effort in the first Jefferson administration to not have the government moderate, to push for even more hardcore reforms, et cetera, and they failed in that, you know, they, 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 they got the short end of the stick, so to speak. But really, overall, first Jefferson administration in terms of overall, you know, just presidential administrations, it, it gets, it gets high uh, grades. It gets high marks in, in, in my book. Uh, but the second Jefferson administration, that's, that's where the downfall truly begins. And that is where we will leave off here today on the Liberty versus power podcast. Again, thank you so much for joining. If you enjoy this content, please rate review, tell your friends. Uh, again, history is so important to, you know, the better we understand the past, the better equipped we're going to be to deal with the future. Until next time, this has been Tho Bishop, Patrick Newman. Keep listening. Wow, geez. Oh, oh. Uh, Tommy, Tommy, what are you, what are you saying? <laughs>